Roland Huang, this is a new day. You've been, you know, the NRDC you know, does a lot of things to address climate change. Put this in the context in terms of other accomplishments, other policies. How big a deal is this? Uh, this is a huge deal. This is, this is a really big deal. When you combine this latest round of standards, 2017 to 2025, with the first round of standards of the Obama administration, California, and the automakers also negotiated back in 2009, this is the single biggest step in a generation to get our country off of oil and cut carbon pollution. This is a big deal. It'll cut your fuel bill in half, and by 2030, it'll cut oil imports by a third, and it'll cut, cut the equivalent in terms of carbon pollution of 90 million cars. This is a big deal. So I want to get a little bit about how did this happen? Because just a few years ago, uh, regulators in, in Sacramento would announce some rules. General Motors would sick their lawyers. The auto companies would sue. And here we have this kind of kumbaya moment up here. Um, <laughs> how, how did this, what changed? How did this happen? Mary Nichols? Uh, well, I'll start, I guess. Um, I think it was a number of forces coming into play at the exact same time. I, I want to give credit going back a few years to uh, leadership in California, particularly to uh, then Assemblymember Fran Pavley, who authored a bill ordering California to set tailpipe emission standards for greenhouse gases. This was a wild and crazy idea at the time, except to a few people. But um, <laughs> as it turned out, it did play a critical role in moving everybody's thinking in a different direction. At the same time, the US Supreme Court was telling the Bush administration they had to take action against greenhouse gases. They couldn't um, ignore them, that they were a form of air pollution, and they were going to have to do something. In turn, I would say some very uh, thoughtful people in the auto industry started thinking about whether there wasn't a way that they could embrace this concept rather than uh, simply keep on fighting um, what seemed to be constant battles in the political arena where um, nobody was really getting anywhere. And they saw a chance, as, uh, as Shad said, to try to get California and the federal government into alignment. And at the same time, uh, the country elected a new president. And President Obama made it clear that when he went into office, he said this during the campaign, and practically the day after he was elected, he started working on setting national standards for vehicles. So I think the handwriting was on the wall. The car companies had been through a terrible economic uh, crisis. There was an issue about the future and how it was all going to play out. And everybody was ready for once, and sometimes it does take a crisis, to think differently, to do things a little bit differently, and maybe take some risks of sitting down and talking. Chad Bolt, how did you think it came about? Yeah, for, for GM's perspective, I mean, if you look at the old business model, it just wasn't working. And I think we also underestimated. Well, it was working while gas prices were low. And then 2008 hit. We, we had no car that would, would compete in the marketplace, and our, our dealers were watching people run into competitor showrooms. That will never happen again. We now have a car out on the market that gets best in class fuel economy, and it unseated two of our top competitors. So we're back in that game for sure. But I think um, the business model wasn't working, and so it required a cultural shift. And we underestimated the image and reputation aspect of the whole situation as well. People did not want to buy one of our products because we, were, we had a history of fighting and looking for you know, any alternative besides building better cars. So with the cultural change, it makes, it, there's a business case for it. There's such, there seems to be such a public hatred towards petroleum-based fuel that, that why not you know, build a product that uses anything but? And so that makes sense. We're going to leverage that. And I think that that is going to help shape where we go in the future in terms of automotive technology. Is General Motors playing along here because taxpayers own a quarter of the company? Is that part of the process? Well, certainly. Absolutely. I mean, of course, we're grateful for having a second chance. And we have to, uh, there is added pressure to make sure that, that we deliver um, not only what everybody expects, but what they don't expect. So while the regulatory framework is fantastic, from our standpoint and from the innovators in the company, we want to do better. That'll give us our competitive edge. We don't just want to meet the standards, but we want to do more.